art is the best way to relieve your mind of stress, help your entire body relax, and put you in a much more amenable, contented mood. So, in the beginning of our Art at Home lessons and activities, I talk about a particular artist. My hope is that when you look at the work of this artist, you will be inspired to do your own because my goal is to get you involved in your own creative process, to get you doing art to help you feel contented and pleased with being stuck at home. To begin with tonight, we are going to talk about an artist named El Anatsui. El Anatsui comes from Ghana, but now lives in Nigeria. He is a world-renowned artist who's shown his work in prominent locations like the Venice Biennial. He has become extraordinarily well-known and looked up to. His work is extraordinary. Perhaps you were lucky enough to see his solo show at the Brooklyn Museum a few years ago. It was magnificent. They filled multiple galleries with his works, which are enormous. He was born in 1944. He is a sculptor who's been active for most of his career in Nigeria. And he has drawn particularly, particular international attention for his bottle top installations. These installations consist of thousands of aluminum pieces sourced from alcohol recycling stations and sewn together with copper wire. They are then transformed into metallic cloth-like wall sculptures sometimes floor sculptures. And even though they seem to be stiff, and if you've ever touched bottle caps, you know they are stiff, Elena Tsui has transformed them into free and flexible installations and sculptures. He was born in Anyako in the Volta region of Ghana. He was the youngest of his father's 32 children. Anatsui lost his mother and was raised by his uncle. His first experience with art was through drawing letters on a chalkboard. He trained at the College of Art, the University of Science and Technology in Kumasi in central Ghana. His work with sculpture and wood carving started as a hobby to keep alive the traditions he grew up with. And then he began teaching at the University of Nigeria, Nusuka, in 1975, and has become affiliated with the Nusuka group for many years. I want to talk about this wonderful book, which is the catalog from Ellen Anatsui's show at the Brooklyn Museum. It has the most magnificent images of his work. If you can get a hold of it, I'm bet betting you can find it on Amazon. I recommend it highly. It is worth purchasing. For the next part of our lesson, we will be looking directly at images of the sculpture and installations that Anatsui has created. And this will get us pumped and excited about doing our own project for this evening. We'll talk about the images. I'll give you a little bit more biographical information about him. Then I will demonstrate for you a project that you can make at home with materials that are readily available and easy to find. Amatsui uses clay, wood, and found objects to create sculptures based on traditional Ghanaian beliefs and other subjects. He has cut wood with chainsaws and blackened it with acetylene torches. More recently, he has turned to installation art, 
Some of his works resemble woven cloths such as kente cloth, a traditional Guinean and African fabric, but are intended as sculptures, not textiles. These works are made from found objects, usually metal bottle caps, which are tied together with wire to create vast sculptures that resemble tapestries. Antsui incorporates Adinsubli, a portmanteau of Uli, Nisbidi, and Adinkra symbols, alongside Ghanaian motifs into his work. And Atsui said that in developing his art, he looked for something that had more relationship to me as someone growing up in an African country. He wanted to draw connections between consumption, waste, and the environment. Again, a quote from Anatsui, art grows out of each particular situation. And I believe that artists are better off working with whatever their environment throws up. Here is an example of one of Anatsui's wall installations. You probably can't see from this tiny picture, but it is made from thousands, if not millions, of small bottle caps that are threaded together with wire. It looks like fabric. It really does look like a textile. And the size of it is enormous. His pieces are huge. They can cover up the entire wall of any gallery or museum. Sometimes he uses also the labels, metal labels, that are sometimes found on bottle, bottles in Africa, and he threads them together into these gorgeous installations. They look stiff and hard, and the actual material that he uses is hard, but they are very bendable, very flexible, and very easy to move around. And he likes to bunch them up to make them look even more 3D. So you can kind of see from the shadows that he has pushed certain parts of the piece into the wall while allowing other parts of it to belly outwards. He frequently uses colors that we think of as traditionally African, black, yellow, green, red, tend to predominate in his work. But it depends on the bottle caps that he actually finds. I am just so thrilled that he uses found materials in his work. And I have found in my travels in Africa that African artists frequently use found objects and create masterpieces from them. It seems to be a genius of the African people to reuse and reduce the waste that is created in their cultures. We're looking at another Anatsui uh, installation made from bottle caps. Look at the gorgeous, gorgeous colors and textures, the way it drapes so magnificently, and the way it bellies out in the middle. I really love the circular motif here in the middle, and I particularly like the red edges that you see in different parts of the piece. Again, this is gigantic piece of work. Anatsui's career grew gradually, starting in his home village of Nsuka, before branching off to places such as Enugu and Lagos, and eventually internationally. In 1990, Anatsui had his first important group show at the Studio Museum in Harlem in New York. He also was one of three artists singled out in the 1990 exhibition Contemporary African Artists Changing Traditions, which was extended for five years. Anatsui has since exhibited his work around the world, 
including at the Brooklyn Museum. That was his solo show in 2013. The Clark Art Institute in 2011. The Rice University Art Gallery in Houston in 2010. The Metropolitan Museum of Art from 2008 to 2009. The National Museum of African Art, Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C. in 2008, etc., etc. In 1995, Anatsui had held his first solo exhibition outside of Africa in London. He expressed a variety of themes and demonstrated how African art can be shown in a multitude of ways that are not seen as typical African. His work utilized conceptual modes used by European and American artists, but hardly in African countries. Anatsui showed his work at the De Young Museum in San Francisco in 2005. This was his first time appearing as part of the permanent collection in a major art museum. Also in 2005, his exhibition at New York Scoto Gallery De Nudo was the first display of his metal sheets in an American city. At this gallery, Scoto Aghabawa presented Anatsui's wood wall panels alongside Salowitz drawings. This exhibition popularized his bottle cap works as he gained more recognition in the press. Anatsui was then invited to the Venice Biennial in 2006 and again in 2007 where he was commissioned to make two hanging metal tapestries. During the 2007 edition, he exhibited his works at the Palazzo Fortuni, which consisted of newly built walls for him to display three metal hangings entitled Du Sasa. This image that we're looking at now, I hope will give you a sense of the scale of his pieces. I mean, it's just huge. And again, you can see the, the deliberate use of the material that he's created so that he can make these beautiful ridges. You see where these shadows are. It's actually where he's bent the, the bottle cap material into the wall itself so that you get this rippling effect. It, it looks also not just like Texas, it kind of looks like the surface of a mountain, a craggy uh, mountain with, with lots of ins and outs. It's just extraordinary. And how genius is this red stripe and red line that he has through the middle. This, this part here really makes you look at this other interesting focal point in the middle of the piece, a more circular shape. Just really am amazed by his work. One of the other really cool things about Ellen Itsui is he employs many, many people to help him construct these pieces. So he's not only creating art, he's also creating a livelihood for whole villages of people in Nigeria where he has his studio. It's quite, quite a wonderful concept. So he employs many, usually young men, who help him thread all of these millions of bottle caps together to create his work. This is another major piece by Ellen Itsui made from those bottle caps. I failed to mention earlier that the bottle caps are often flattened out. It makes it easier for them to be threaded and wired together. And in a moment, I'm going to show you a detail so you can see how flat they really are. But this is what, for me, is artistic genius. The decisions he made to place different colored caps in different places. How did he make these decisions? How did he know 
that the finished piece was going to be a fully realized sculpture. It's just a magnificent piece of work. Now we're going to look at a small detail. It comes from this part of the larger piece so that you can see more easily what the flattened bottle caps look like up close. And you can really understand how he actually threads them together. So here's our detail. I think you can see how some of them are flattened out. I'm loving this particular part of the piece because of how colorful it is. It's very lacy too. So you can see some of the bottle caps are not flat. They're circular still, but some of them are pressed. Some of them have been cut into small squares. And he's left a lot of gaps, a lot of openings in between each piece. Apparently he likes the pieces to be almost transparent so that when you look through them, you can see light. Really wonderful piece. A 2010 retrospective of his work entitled When I Last Wrote to You About Africa was organized by the Museum for African Art and opened at the Royal Ontario Museum in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. A major exhibition of his more recent works entitled Gravity and Grace, Monumental Works by El Anatsui had its New York premiere at the Brooklyn Museum in 2013. It was organized by the Akron Art Museum and the exhibition later traveled to the Des Moines Art Center in 2014 and the Bass Museum of Art in Miami in 2014 as well. Inspired by Anatsui, our project for this evening is going to be to create a weaving. This is a weaving that I'm very personally proud of. I created this piece with my students and the faculty of a school that I worked in for many, many years. They brought in pieces of material that had memories for them. For example, maybe an old t-shirt of grandpa's, maybe their blankie from when they were babies that was no good anymore and that mom had shredded and put in her scrap pile. And we all wove it together on this loom. So this is called the frame loom, a simple frame loom. We are going to be creating our own looms this evening, warping them up and threading them in a very similar manner to the way this piece was created. The materials that you will need for this project are, first of all, cardboard. If you have old boxes around your house, and many of us do, cardboard will be easy to find. If you don't, you can go to any hardware store probably, or Michaels, and find very cheap pieces of cardboard. The thicker it is, you can see that this is the kind of corrugated cardboard you want that. You want a thicker, heavier duty kind of cardboard. This one does bend, which is okay, but you don't want it to be too flexible. The more heavy weight it is, the more rigid it is, the easier it will be for you to use and weave on. So this is a small paper loom. I also started making a larger piece. Again, in the spirit of El Anatsui, he made huge, huge wall installations as we saw earlier. And you will need some kind of string to create what is known as the warp thread. The warp threads are the vertical 
threads in your woven piece, the ones that go up and down. And you want a fairly heavy duty string or twine for the warping process because it holds the whole piece of fabric together. You don't want to use thin threads for warping. I use just normal twine that you can get in any hardware store or any hobby shop or craft store, and it's pretty cheap. Finally, you'll need other kinds of threads or old fabric. And I bet most of you have a lot of this stuff just laying around your house. If not, again, Michael's is a great place to go. You can go Michael's online. There's a Michael's store in Edgewater. There's one at 24th Street and 6th Avenue in Chelsea. And you can find these materials easily there. You're going to need scissors for cutting your threads. And finally, again, in the spirit of El Nen and Itsui, and because this is something that I love and use quite a bit in my own work, plastic bags. So plastic bags are things that I actually hate. They are one of the greatest sources of pollution that we have on Earth today. But I love the color of the New York Times delivery bags. And you will see them frequently in my own art mainly because I love the color. All right. The first step in the process of weaving is to create your warp. You can see that the warp threads go all the way around both sides of the loom. You need to have your piece of cardboard and you need to notch it with scissors. You can see the notches. I'm bending them here. You want to do it top and bottom. And I wouldn't make them any bigger or smaller than about an inch wide. Now, if you're a very precise person, you're probably going to want to measure before you do the cutting. I am not a precise artist and I kind of eyeballed where to create my notches. And it really doesn't matter. It, the beauty of weaving is that it really reflects your own creativity and your own personality. After you've cut your notches top and bottom, we can start warping up. And the way you do it is to tie the thread around the first notch that you created and then start wrapping the warp threads around your loom completely around from front to back and when you get to the final one you just tie it on then comes the fun part start looking for the materials that you want to use to do the weaving I obviously have used the plastic bags, but interspersed with strips of old denim and yarn. I like my weavings to be very textured and lumpy, and that's why I've chosen these fat threads. And you could even call the plastic bags at this stage of the game threads that I have woven through the warp. And that is the whole process of weaving. You want to weave your threads alternately through the warp, under, over, under, over, and so on. Now I'm gonna demonstrate for you how that works. I think at this point I've used a lot of this kind of dark mustard colored yarn. I think I'm going to change to another color yarn. And when you've run out of a thread, or you want to change to another thread, all you have to do is tie it on and just keep going. So 
I'll give me a minute here. This is a bit tangled. One of the most wonderful things about weaving is it's so relaxing. Once you get into the rhythm of the under over process, it's kind of a Zen activity. I think you're going to love it. So because I want my cross threads, some people call the cross horizontal threads the warp or the woof, but the weft or the woof, the warp or the up and down, the woof and the, or the weft are the horizontal pieces that go across. I want them to be thick, so I've doubled this rather thin yarn. I've doubled and tripled, even quadrupled it to make a very fat, fat, juicy thread to go through. And I'm just tying the two ends together so that they will stay connected. a little challenging when you're using so many threads doubled over. You may get a very large bumpy knot, but you can work that into the weaving either by pushing it behind the whole piece of weaving or by weaving over it. So you don't have to worry about those big knots. So I ended this row on top of the warp thread. That means I must start the new row underneath. And then the next warp is I'm going to just keep going with the under and over till we get to the end of the row. Now, I'm standing up to do the weaving. Weaving really, I believe, is best done sitting down. But you'll have to find, you'll discover for yourself how you feel comfortable. And believe me, in the beginning, it helps to say to yourself in your mind, under, over, under, over. Even today, I was missing, if you skip a warp thread, it creates an interesting texture, but it makes it difficult in the end for the piece of weaving to hang together. You want to try and keep track of where you are and keep going in the under, over pattern. There are many weaving stitches, but in the interest of time tonight, I'm going to just teach you the under over stitch. So I ended this row underneath. What do I do next? Watch. I fold the yarn over that warp thread because the last row ended under. Remember, you want to do everything opposite to create the weaving. So over, under, and here we go again with our pattern. You will know you've done it correctly if the new row you're doing is exactly the opposite of the row above it. If you find that you're doing the same pattern as the row above, then you need to go back. You skipped a warp thread somewhere. Need to go back to the row, at least probably just one row above where you are to see if you can locate where the mistake is. And like I said, I was making mistakes earlier today on this piece. It's easy to get distracted. That's the other great thing about weaving. 
it helps you to stay focused. When you're focused, you get into that meditative state. And we need some of that meditation in this age of COVID and the anxiety that it creates. So, I finished this row and I finished over the warp thread. So, what should I do? Watch, I fold the thread under and just keep going over, under, etc. All right, I don't have time this evening to finish this weaving for you, but you can get a feel for how it's growing. One thing that you wanna do with each row that you complete, you want to keep pushing the threads up to the top of your weaving. That will make the whole piece more solid and contained and more durable. Now I will continue this and I'm going to weave all the way to the bottom. When you finish all the way to the bottom, you have a choice. You can either leave it on your loom, which I think is quite attractive, or cut it off the loom. And it's quite simple to do. You cut the warp threads and at the top, you peel them from the notch and tie them together at the top. And the same at the bottom. So you would cut in the middle, pull the warp thread up out of the notch, then tie the two pieces together as close to the top of the, the woven part as you can. Keep the knots tight, do it all the way across the top and all the way across the bottom. And I promise once our COVID isolation is over, I'm really thinking about having an entire month of weaving at the Hoboken Public Library when we can meet again in person. And we have way more time to create much more complex and larger weavings. But for tonight, I'm so glad you came and participated. I want to thank again the Hoboken Public Library for their wonderful sponsoring of these classes, hosting and sponsoring these classes. You can find this class and all the previous Art at Home classes on the Hoboken Public Library website. Just visit hobokenlibrary.org. And for tonight, I want to say art on, good luck, have fun weaving, enjoy the fibers that you touch and use, relax, go with the flow, don't worry about mistakes, it's all good. And I encourage you, please, use some kind of recyclable material in this project. Help keep the earth cleaner, save the planet, and work in the style of El Anatsui and his recycled bottle caps that he turned into such extraordinarily magnificent art. So that ends this lesson. Thank you so much for joining, and I will see you next week when we will talk about another contemporary artist and do a project inspired by that person. Bye-bye!